Hello. For all the parents who are watching this video, picture this. Your child who starts school today will graduate from university sometime late 2030s and their career will last through to 2070 or maybe even beyond. Do you believe that our children are equipped for life, what life would fling at them in 20 years from now? Do we even know what 2040 or 2450 would look like for any of us? What can we do today so that our children are prepared to stay on top of their game in life in the future? If these questions both worry and intrigue you, stay with us for the next 30 minutes while we understand from experts if our children are studying curriculums of the future, and if no, then how do curriculums today need to change so that we are studying curriculums of the future? I am Pooja Kedia from Schoolwiser, and today I'm joined by Mrs. Uttara Singh. Mrs. Singh comes with an experience of two and a half decades in various schools in Delhi NCR. She has donned many hats from that of a teacher, an administrator, and has achieved a host of milestones. Amongst her many acclaims and awards, Mrs. Singh and her team are proud recipients of the prestigious Rex Karamveer Education Chain Champion Award for, change, for creating a positive social impact and attitudinal transformation in the community. Mrs. Singh is currently the director across the Sri Ram Millennium Schools and the principal at the Sri Ram Millennium School, Noida. Mrs. Singh has also been instrumental in both setting up and managing the Sri Ram Millennium Schools across Noida, Gurgaon, and Faridabad. A very warm welcome to you and thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much. I also have with me Mrs. Shashi Banerjee. Mrs. Banerjee has been in the field of education for more than three decades. She holds a master's degree in English and is a graduate in Sanskrit and Hindi. She also has a master's in Indian classical vocal music and Indian classical dance. Mrs. Banerjee is a recipient of the prestigious National Cultural Talent Scholarship from the Government of India. She is currently the head of schools at the Shivnadar School Noida and believes in constantly improvising in keeping with emerging technologies in education. Welcome, Mrs. Banerjee, and thank you for being here with us to share your thoughts today. I also have with me Mr. Spokey Wheeler. Spokey comes with over four decades of international experience and expertise in leadership and management in education. Spokey's experience spans across government, commercial, and not-for-profit organization agencies and universities across geographies. He is also the co-founder at Adhyan, an educational leadership movement for the underprivileged. Spokey has led the strategic planning development and delivery of leadership program designed for over 7,800 school principals in government schools across Kerala, Pondicherry, Maharashtra and Rajasthan for the National Center of School Leadership. He is currently the director at, uh, and head of international school for the Heritage Experiential Learning School. Welcome Mr. Wheeler and it's a pleasure to have you with us today. Hey, lovely to see you. All right, you. thank you. Without any further ado, I'm going to jump straight into it. And I'd like to start with you, Agraji. Um, for a parent who's a layman like me, help me understand how do we see curriculums changing to adapt to the needs of the future? Now, specifically, you know, when we talk about fields of study like English, maths, geography, history, uh, in my mind, English will always have things like nouns and verbs and types of sentences, and maths will always be about addition and multiplication and ratios and proportions. Um, geography will always be about landforms and political maps and physical maps and history will always be about history, history of either the region that you're in or the world. Given this, that, you know, our children do need to le learn all this basic stuff. How does curriculum change, especially with respect to curriculums like or uh, contexts like these look like? Namaste to everyone. Thank you so much, Pooja, for picking up this topic, which I think is very, very important. Uh, so, you know, when you ask me, I can give you a perspective that I believe in. And here, what I feel is curriculum, a basic standard curriculum like you described, is very important and very necessary because basics don't change. I mean, okay. if you're going to learn a language, you have to learn the alphabet, you have to learn the sounds. You know, that's how it pro progresses. What we have to look at is the approach to curriculum 
and also how are we looking at our children being citizens of tomorrow so we have to look at their skill building and their attitudes and those you know things which are required for the future which um, i would say sometimes schools don't really teach which children pick up from the environment if they do but many a time they may not so i think schools of today understand that so if you're teaching language along with you know a b c d's and reading and all of that as the children are growing you are teaching them uh, you know nuances of a language you are teaching them to analyze you are teaching them to interpret if you are looking at history geography today geography is no longer just studying about landforms and political maps i mean the way geography has come into a classroom it's fantastic so you know while this what i feel is the basics of the subjects will remain the same our approach to curriculum will change our approach to our children's uh, you know understanding of the curriculum has to change because i love what i, I hear you say just just help us understand with an example so you mentioned the way geography has come to the classroom is different give us an example so parents who are watching this okay. video can actually put that in perspective so you picked up my favorite subject because i was teaching geography at one particular time so you know when you suppose you are teaching children mapping okay in icsc we are still teaching topo sheets okay now you are still teaching symbols and stuff like that today with google maps on your phone google uh, earth on your laptop you don't really need that right but still the basics of mapping are the same but to understand let's say latitudes and longitudes that's a very important part of geography which is very application based whether you get into being a pilot or a marine engineer or anything today you need to understand location right so today if your teacher does not use the tools available to her like google earth like bring in the earth into the classroom show the children how it works and the way the children understand it is they use it ask them to use google maps to check location to do things and i think we are only getting better and better with technology to make all these things so much more application based thank you so much and i think i i, I kind of think a lot of a little bit of that that i'm going to dwell into later in the conversation as well um but essentially what you've said is that the basics will stay yes our children will continue to learn the basis of education which is the basic maths the numeracy the languages but what needs to change is the approach and the kind of skills that the kids are taught in classrooms today and thank you so much for that uh, that example um if i could now come to you um spoky with my next question so we've kind of spoken about the the standard subjects but we've also seen curriculums now evolve and they've started uh looking at uh, curriculums like uh, artificial intelligence coding robotics in your experience um what is the purpose of teaching these is it is it just a fad because you know that's that's the new thing to do and kids will learn it for the next 7 years and then it's going to fade off and it will be replaced by something else or is there a deep rooted purpose so uh, good morning everyone uh, actually good afternoon i guess i'd like to begin by putting a perspective onto this In 2048 it's predicted that you will be able to buy a computer for the equivalent of 1000 US which will have the computational capacity of the entire human species. Wow. The world we work in will never be the same. In some ways what covid has done is it has impelled us into a future which as yet none of us can predict they say today that an engineering student who begins his first year or her first year within 3 years at least a third of what they've taught in year 1 will be out of date and so what we have to begin to look at is not so much what we learn but how we learn uh if we look across my journey um from uh 50 what is it 29 states and union territories over the last decade um probably now 3 and a half to 4000 lesson observations from the poorest to the richest schools in the country um uh there has been a wave in terms of um the english medium but the english medium is no longer the most important language that our children and we are going to speak um coding is the future coding has been working in schools for 10 to 20 years but coding now will determine 
I guess, what all of us want in terms of education, which is collaboration. Uh, we, we only have to think, um, uh, if I give an example of COVID, at the moment, around the world, um, uh, experts are endeavoring to create a vaccine. None of them are working in a single nation. Almost all of them are collaborating together and the coding that they undertake will enable us to get a vaccine, we believe, which will then give us a new sense of normality moving forward. So for me, I think it's pretty simple. Um, yes, we will continue to need to do all of the things we've already done, but we need to recognize that we will have another common language which will bind us and will help us to, to be able to ensure our children are interested in how. And I guess my last piece in this is that all of us have been on a journey over the last couple of decades from tell to ask. Mm -hmm. As parents, we now ask our children many more questions than we ever did before, it seems to me, or are confident to ask them, even if we are uncertain of the answers. And I think we're also on a journey from know to understand. And the, the curriculum is moving us from a what curriculum to a how curriculum and a why curriculum. Great, thank you so much. And thanks for putting that in perspective for us. Um, I kind of hear you echo what Uttaraji had mentioned, which is the focus on skill. Um, you mentioned about collaboration and the need for introduction of AI and robotics, not, not so much for the knowledge, but more for the skill. So the skill of being able to think logically, the skill of knowing cause and effect, and exposing our children to probably a more advanced uh, AI, which they will uh, have in their life. So thank you so much. Um, if I could come to you, Shashiji, uh, you know, one of the things that we've kind of continuously spoken about in the last 15 minutes is change. Now, we, we understand that we're living in a world where the only thing that does not change is that everything changes. Given that, what are schools currently doing to ensure that a child is equipped to handle change um, and also help us understand if that is being done, how, uh, you know, effectively is that assessed? That, you know, how, how effectively are uh, children actually become change, becoming change agents? Uh, Shashi, I think you're on mute. Shashi, you're on mute, yeah. Try again, please. I can't seem to hear you. Where change um, is something which is going to be constant, how are schools making sure that children um, understand change, uh, accept change, and then you know manage to change with change? So you know, Pooja, let me tell you one thing. Children are very naturally uh, they adapt to change. Children, because as they grow, they are changing, right? right? I think many a times the regimentation of school stops them from their natural curiosity and their natural desire for change. I think if schools would let children be, uh, we wouldn't have to do too much <laughs> to make them adapt to change. But at the okay. same time, like, like, you know, we do have to bring in certain things. And I completely agree with Mr. Vila where he said that, you know, uh, coding and AI is something that will become a new language. At the same time, what I feel is there will always be the musicians and the artists and the singers and the sports people who are required in the world and who may not want to get into coding and AI, right? So as schools, we have to provide an even platform for everybody to be able to find out what it is that makes them tick. And while it comes to adapting to change, I think it's very important that we keep changing. You know, if the school environment and the school curriculum and the school uh, faculty and the entire learning environment of a nation, I think, has to be progressive and ready to change. Because when, as adults, if we showcase that we are ready to be flexible and to change, our children are just going to, you know, adapt to it so easily. Because like I said, children are naturally, uh, you know, as they're growing, they want to change. So we should have a more open environment. 
I think what you said is, is key. Um, what I hear you say is that I think it's the environment that the child gets. And if the environment is progressive, and I love the word that you've used, likelihood is that the child, that is what the child will see and that is what the child will learn. Um, could I just quickly check, Shashiji, is your audio back? No, you're not audible yet. No. <laughs> All right. I'll, I'll anyway move on um, and, and ask a follow-up question. And this is again for you, uh, Uttaraji. So we, we've mentioned, yes, the curriculums should be changing. And that's one of the key things. Now, help us understand, is there a, is there a sense that you have in terms of how often should we be looking at curriculum changes? I know that the national education policy has come in. Uh, and, you know, at, after a very long time, I think there has been a big change in the way education is, uh, is being imported. But it, it was uh, time now for that change to come about. Ideally, in an ideal world, um, how often do you think this change should come about? My, my guess is that the change, that the period of change will shorten every few years because the world is changing at a greater pace. Uh, but just give me a sense of two years, five years, 10 years, what is your sense and who should be doing this change? Is it the school, is it the CBSC, is it the government? So, you know, Pooja, if you look at our lifespan, if you look at from last, say, 20 years, we've moved so fast from a landline phone to the phone today being the smartest thing probably in our lives, right? I mean, the, the smartphone is called a smartphone for a reason. Now, the change, change is happening so fast. Curriculum as a basic curriculum is not changing so fast. But I think as, uh, you know, as schools, we have to be uh, very on the point of it and try to adapt faster. For a, for a government to change curriculum, for a board to look at curriculum, the, uh, you know, uh, the platform is too huge in our country. We have too many states and education being a state subject, there are so many things that come into education as a policy, right? So if you look at it from a government perspective, the government is trying its best to make sure that India is right there on the map of education. But our country is too diverse and too vast for it to happen like, you know, like that. It's, it's going to take time, right? But as schools, what I feel is what we should do is we should constantly, because the government doesn't say that as a school, you can't do this or you can't do that, right? right. So if I talk about right. us as the Shira Millennium Schools, we revisit curriculum every term, right? And we revisit, in fact, in this uh, COVID time, we are revisiting it every month because we need to understand curriculum has to flow from the children. Curriculum can't be totally decided by a teacher because if I decide I want to teach this, but my learners are not ready, then that curriculum makes no sense. It, curriculum is never a one-way delivery, right? So at our schools, under normal circumstances, we review it every six months. We have uh, something called a vertical meet and we review it across classes, you know? Mm -hmm. So we look at it like if a child is learning something in class one, then two, then three, is there a progression? Does something need to be changed? Let's say they've learned, uh, you know, uh, HCF, LCM in grade four, but teachers feel, no, it needs to be revised in grade five, the batch that came to us. So, you know, it's a live curriculum and it has to flow from the children. So that's about the basic curriculum, let's say that's defined by your board or by the government. But as a school, we have to look at providing our children with so many opportunities where they are able to evolve as human beings. And that is not restricted to curriculum. That is right. that involves right. so many other things, you know. So whether it's MUNs, giving them exchange programs, these are all now part of curriculum. They are no longer things which you can say, oh, we do as extracurricular. But we are millennials, we call it co-curricular. And you know, right. we try right. to give our children all these opportunities right from a very young age. So like uh, Mr. Wheeler talked about, you know, uh, the how. So, you know, we have a we we follow a particular thing called wonder time where we make our little ones in nursery, just we, we'll put up something for them and leave it. And now we want them to question, why does this happen? How does this happen? So the teacher is not giving the answers anymore. The children are trying to find out the answers. And honestly, so today, no. okay. I, I can go on, but yeah. No, no, that's fine. But I, I, I love what you said about, uh, you know, the, the, the curriculum being learner-centric. And you get, obviously, a new set of learners every year. So uh, in your opinion, you know, as, as you've just explained, a maximum of a year when you look at a curriculum, it need not probably change, but you need to look at it and say, is it still good for this year? Is it still doing justice to what we are trying to achieve? 
Um, thank you so much. Uh, Shashi ji, can I just check if we've got any luck with your audio? Oh, it's a shame. No, we still can't hear you, unfortunately. Okay, I will keep the, keep the talk alive. I'm going to come to you now, Mr. Vila. Um, you know, just taking a clue from what Udraji said, that you can't sometimes rely on the government and CBS. Obviously, there is a, a, a level of bureaucracy that is there. There is that time-taking mechanism, which we can't really uh, always deal with. In an event when a curriculum change typically takes longer than desirable, can the school do anything at their own level to make sure that that change is brought through by change in pedagogy rather than the actual change in curriculum? Um, when I was a student, I, uh, I rowed. I was the captain of rowing for my school. As a consequence of which, I went forwards by looking backwards. And it seems to me that one of the things we risk is forgetting where we've come from in order to get to where we need to be. And um, if I can give an example, uh, I had a sore throat this morning. So I used indigenous knowledge. I got haldi and I got um, honey and I put them together and I put them in my mouth and left it there for a while before I swallowed. My throat feels very much better now. We, India probably values knowledge more than any other nation in the world. Um, but sometimes there is the risk that a weakness is an overplayed strength. And we no longer exist in, a, in an environment where there is anything called um, a solid body of unchanging knowledge. And, and um, um, none of us are experts anymore. It was very gracious of you to call us that earlier. But the, we therefore have to ask ourselves, how do we learn to move forward? I, I think it is really important that the national, uh, the new national education policy is speaking the, exactly the same language that Uttar is, and having listened to Shakshi already, the same language that she would be using, and exactly the same as ours. We're talking now about giving ownership to children. We talk right. about collaboration, um, inquiry being at the heart of learning. Government is even using the word experiential. Um, and we are now recognizing that child-centeredness is about giving ownership to children of their own learning. That doesn't mean that we back off and don't do anything, but it means we more often facilitate than we direct. And I think for me, that's been a big shift. But I, 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 when you were discussing, so how do you make the changes in the curriculum? Uh, I'm clear like Uttara that there is no such thing as a moment when you look at the curriculum. The curricular development is continuous. And then of course, we will have moments where we reflect on where we are, look back at where we've been in and move forward. But I just wanna use the example of COVID. All of us round about, I don't know, um, uh, early March, um, uh, were impelled into an environment where suddenly we became virtual schools when the day before we became physical. For us, it was just before the midterm break. And at the midterm break, I said to my teachers, who are wonderful, um, you know you thought you were going to have a holiday. Well, actually, we're going to be training together. And during that week, we learned uh, how to, be, um, to undertake emergency virtual teaching. That's very different from virtual learning. And if I look at the biggest journey that occurred, it was not by educators talking with each other, just. It was not just by us listening to children. It was by us listening to parents. And um, uh, we changed what we did within two weeks. You know, um, uh, because we were getting feedback. This is the first generation of parents in the history of the world 
that has ever had the ability to be inside their child's classroom yeah. whenever they want to, or as long as they want to. And you know, what a surprise, they have an opinion. <laughs> and, and that has and been such a learning curve. Yeah, it's, it's not just an opinion, it's a partnership and they join yeah. in and they add to the teaching and learning. So I think that's marvelous. Yes. Great, it's Chachi, it's so lovely to hear you. All right, yeah, so I'm quickly yeah. going to sum that up. I, I love what you said, that you said, um, Spoki, that we need to have an environment of continuous learning, and learning does not just need to be forward-looking. You need to be able to go back and look at what you've done and learn from your mistakes or see what you, what has worked well in the past, and don't forget your roots. And I think you, you kind of put that beautifully. India truly is a country that has its knowledge really deep rooted. And we need to kind of go back to things that we already have with us rather than exploring outside. And can I just for a moment <laughs> then just pick up on that is that what we always knew that actually collaboration and partnership as Shashi said is at the heart of things. But the blinding flash of the obvious for me was we need to spend even more time talking with our stakeholders as a continuity. And, and that conversation, I think, is changing the dynamic in terms of how we are looking at learning and how we are looking at teaching. And so for me, my, my, my evening conversation before dinner with two or three parents, um, our, our teachers sitting down once a week with each of their, their, their families in the primary section, um, to be able to develop that relationship. And I think that, that there is an irony here um, that I believe that the bond that is occurring, and I'm convinced that both Shashi and Uttara will feel this is the same, is in some cases stronger between parents and teachers yes. now than it was before. And, and it is because we're in each other's homes. Yes. And, and that, that has enormous power for the, the future. I think I totally second that. I've um, got two little ones of my own and I think I feel the teacher's pain, especially during this time, time and I'm sure as a parent they feel mine. So we've kind of bonded and connected a lot more than what I would have done in the last you know, seven to ten years. Um, so great, thank you so much for that. Um, Mrs. Banerjee, I'm, I'm going to come to you. I'm think, sure all the parents who are watching this uh, video are saying, you know, that's all well and good, but how do you go about making a change when at the end of you know, the, the year at the end of uh, the senior grade, what you're putting a child through is a regular CBSE exam. So help us understand, do you also uh, believe that the assessment needs to change in a big way? Uh, why are we looking at curriculum changes? Why are we looking at skill development? Do we also need to bring about a change in how we assess a, children, a, a child and what we assess them on? So what I'd like to submit in all humility is that learning is stipulation agnostic you know of a curriculum and we we did that when we started uh, school we were lucky we were fortunate we could have heads to, and hearts together who thought of doing it differently because we were all parents who lived through it so despite you know the so-called cbsc uh, prescriptive curriculum as they say and though they to grant them they've been trying to uh, explore and unpack and do things accordingly. But you know, it all boils down to the DNA of change within an organization. It's not that change happens because you, there is a demand for change. So it's the preparation which gives you that one moment of the vision of the Almighty. You know, you keep preparing your whole life for a moment, for that one moment. So the preparation is the DNA, it's a constant. Uh, exploration into the human mind and heart age-wise. And as uh, Uthra, when she started off and she was saying the curriculum is something that you look at learner-centric, but what I've, and I completely agree. And as Pokey said that, you know, look at the partnerships emerging and who was prepared for a pandemic of this nature. But if the organization is poised towards unlearning, learning, relearning, lifelong learning as a culture. So, you know, the epistemic intelligence, the cultural, social, emotional, physical, heuristic intelligence, you know, to be able to see beyond the bend starts off at 
very early in age. You know, you don't have to have a teacher practice this and then do it. You have to have an environment. So what we simply do is, and we have a CBSE, uh, and we, we use this one statement like the uh, Gail, I think. We also make steam. So we say we also do examination, board examination. So rest everything keeps happening. And yes, it's a matter of pride for the children to get all those obscene 100 on 100s and 99 on 100s. It's all right. That happens, by the way. But that's not the focus. The focus is building a well, raising a, a, a kind of a, a space where people can come and eat and drink for the slum dwellers, doing something, going and learning with them, sitting with the gardener. Everyone's a teacher. So while our, our building keeps getting constructed, we say, as Matthew, our senior head says, we keep chipping away, literally so, because the refurbishment and the building keeps happening according to the curriculum needs. It's not that you give a structure to a school. As and when the art department wants to design an art space, they design it. As and when the sports want. So, you know, you have to understand this subtle balance between order and conformity between standards and standardization. And I know this is something that Spokey has always instilled within the educators who come to him. What does a, a, an environment or a school where thinking and asking is happening, what does it look like? What does it look like? So when you start looking at these questions, then the way the educator steps in, we have just one line saying, uh, admission to Shiv Nadir school is stringent only for teachers. The reason was that you had to really have a belief. So I think it's all curriculum agnostic. We run an international curriculum, CBSE curriculum. I'd rather even the state curriculum is all right. It's how you do it. As Absolutely. Able, uh, Absolutely. Thank you so much. It's also, about, it's also about value driven, you know, frugality, adaptability. The ability to collaborate, it's not easy. If you're competing with yourselves and others, Absolutely. compete with yourself. Yes, be better than what you were. So I think when I look at uh, uh, the entire design for a school, I agree with my uh, teammates who are saying that the COVID-19 simply got us on a fast track to understand. Absolutely. That, we would have that is absolutely four years to get into. Look at the parent-teacher meetings that are happening. Look at the meeting rooms. Look at how technology has come to our, you know, to save time, save traffic. So I think a lot of good has come out of it. We should have absolutely. the eyes first and the heart to understand what it is telling us and not get back to our evil ways. Sorry, quote unquote. Yeah. I love the passion when you've spoken about all this. And, and I know that this is all, you know, heartfelt and you, you truly believe that, you know, there is a lot of good that's coming out of the curriculum. Um, just going to take a, take a pause here. Uh, just while that is really great, but from a parent's perspective, you know, when they kind of hear a talk, what's really positive is that we've got educators like the three of you who are very forward thinking, progressive, like you mentioned, you know, you've got DNA, uh, you've got that change DNA in you, which is very, very key to be able to drive an institutional, which again, you know, is, is comfortable with change, is happy to kind of look at change every now and then. Having said that, everything kind of comes to a standstill when a child comes and has to sit for their board exam. Um, you Today we have CBSE exams and at the end of grade 10 or grade 12, when a child has to, has to sit down for an academic focus exam, um, while the skills and everything else that we talk about is fair and good, but the child's focus, obviously at that stage, because everything depends on how the grades are in those exams, kind of shifts towards doing academically well. Given that, do you think in the near future, um, are we looking at a change in the way assessments happen? Because without a change in assessment, I believe that a change in the curriculum or change in pedagogy would only have a limited impact on the skill development or getting our children future ready. So please help me understand all these discussions that you have in your meeting rooms, where you say that we should look at getting a child to sit for maybe different kinds of exam, an open book exam and testing skills more than the knowledge. So the process of how they found the information rather than the actual result of the information itself. So Pooja, I'll just put it into 
two subsets. One is that this has already been happening. And as I said, over the past uh, decade or so, you would have open textbook exams in some of the more evolved institutions in the sense people who, you know, open-mindedness is another something with which institutions take uh, learning ahead. Right. And uh, so, but you know, we have a common minimum program in the national curriculum in which you kind of put together people right there where there are no resources to just one book and one teacher and so many children. So I think it's not fair to make a comparison there to say that assessment should be the same for everyone. And I think I saw a glimmer of hope if it is implemented well, because policy is an advisory of a kind of suggestion. Implementation happens at the level of the schools and the educators. So my submission to educators is every policy has to be interpreted in its right perspective, according to the context if there are, so we are talking about schools where we have children with devices, connectivity. And I look at about more than a hundred children coming to my school who are from the neighborhood villages. You have to provide those devices and the connectivity and the training to their parents. So, you know, is that happening at a larger level in the government schools? So maybe those are questions. How are we using mass media? So that is why, you know, there is that one yard to measure everything in our assessments and they become quite a joke sometimes. And it is very disheartening for children sometimes, but honestly, learning by understanding prepares you for that kind of examination as well. You don't have to only prepare for that kind of examination and people will be uh, exploring newer, larger universal patterns. Look at the IB program. Although the IGCSE IB were both under scanner right now for the way the predicted grades, etc., were being calculated and children did feel disheartened. So, but is the system open? Yes, it is open to ask the educators, look at what the parents want, rejig, redo, redevise. So it's like dramaturgy, devising as you go. So learning um, I, I'm quite a fan of Dorothy Hepford's learning, you know, drama is a learning medium. So if you look at even real life learning, if you're building a well, you learn dimension, proportion, you do everything. That is not stopping you from writing an exam well, provided you're giving the skills to read and write and write in a stipulated time. So I don't think there is an either or, but it's a difficult question when it comes to resources. I think in our country, we have to see where the school operates, where the learner is, where the teacher is, what kind of a support is given. So it's, it's a larger, more complicated thing. And we are very fortunate, I would say for myself, to be in part of a foundation where the wherewithal is available and you can reach out. But there are schools who are running significantly well with minimum resources. And I think that's amazing. And that brings out a lot of creativity too. So assessment cannot be held as the only devil against the whole system. The implementation, look at all our UPSC and all other exams, there's such a row over NEET, there's such a row over everything. So examination is in a way a monster around. But does school education need to harp upon that and succumb to everything else, uh, to, to that or everything else? I don't think so. I think the teacher needs to be empowered. The educator needs to be empowered. And we can all do it. We have to empower each other. We have to have a teaching learning biradari. And that is should be more than the policy makers and, the, and, and a voice. So student agency, teacher agency, the school promotes that. And not image projection. We are not against anybody. All schools do good work. Tell me, the school was there to educate a child to the fullest and they give their heart and soul. So I think it is the parent who needs to see what is their context, what suits them best, where will this, well, where will this child find cultural alignment, social emotional alignment. And I think with that, I would like to say that I, I think this is a brilliant conversation to be hearing from the others. Um, we all find our ways and there are ways to it. We have to read, we have to research, we have to analyze, and the answers are there. Uh, looking at indigenous knowledge systems should not be discounted. 
want to second. Thank you so much. Um, Shashi ji, I love what you said about the, the teacher and the learner biradari. I think that, that resonates with me and I'm sure it would with a lot of other parents as well. So there needs to be a community that focus, uh, focuses on learning more than really worrying about the examination. And I lo also love what you said about examinations and learning not being mutually exclusive. So they can mm -hmm. go hand in hand. And it's up to us as educators, as parents and as learners to only give it as much importance as is due. At the end of the day, what's important in life is probably not that 80% or the 100%, but how satisfied and happy and fulfilled you feel in life. So thank you so much for that. Um, we're kind of coming to the end of the discussion, but because we've heard so much, uh, so little from Shashiji in the first half, I would like to ask one last question before we come to the closing, Shashiji, for you. Sure. Um, there's no doubt that I think technology in a big way has been a boom during this time, especially during COVID. Um, but again, I think a lot of us have come to realize that excess of excessive of everything is bad. So a lot of technology and a lot of dependence on technology has also set in a lot of frustration, uh, a lot of, uh, uh, you know, anger. Um, and obviously, you know, there are other health issues that are related to this. Keeping this in mind, we also have kind of now come to realize the importance of uh, the actual physical classes. In your opinion, in the next 10, 15 years, once schools open and we've got physical classes, and I think the way forward is going to be a little bit of blended learning, what role do you see technology playing in the future? So you see, technology in the broader perspective is the tools, the, the platforms that you create for communication, the easing and of the ebb and flow of communication, sharing, and in the absence of a physical environment, thank goodness we had this environment to be connected. So we call it connected learning. And even in the impure air scenario, this was happening. There were Google classrooms, people were connecting and learning was happening. I think technology is something which needs to be handled and managed prudently, judiciously. That is where is the whole difference. It's like saying food gives you energy. But you can't be gobbling food from morning till night because you want, you need to know what to eat, when, with what, uh, how to collate energies. I think that training right from scratch is very important for the educator and for the systems across, whether it's the private school systems or the government, people should build curriculum, weaving in the tools the toolkit for a teacher, which is technology based. You heard spoke, we just talked about how coding. So we had, uh, uh, most of our assessments were happening through technology even before this happened, because that was easier. You know, and an open textbook doesn't have to be on premises. You do, you have, how will you inculcate the value of integrity? Only when you leave a person to say, look, nobody's watching you, you do what you want to. And, and then there is that sense of responsibility. So I think we have a huge opportunity here to deploy technology according to pedagogical uh, you know, uh, needs. And not just because it's something that will capture, uh, people would just do you know, PowerPoints and that's not technology. Technology is like making a good cup of tea, which has aroma, which, which really makes you feel satisfied right up to the soul. For that, you need which to use, to use, how much to brew, and what to serve to whom. Uh, I don't know if that makes sense, but to me it does. That makes complete sense. I love, I love the example that you gave, and I love what you said about knowing the when, how, and how much, because uh, too much of everything can, can kind of cause issues. So I love also what you said about connected learning, which is very, very true. And technology being an enabler and being able to incorporate that enabler in the measures that are right for the pedagogy that you follow. So thank you so much for that. Um, we have come to the tail end of our discussion today. And as a closing thought, I would want to uh, get the same, uh, you know, one key tip from all of you. So I'd like to start with you, Spooky, if that's all right. How, in your opinion, uh, can parents ensure that their child learns what is important today and are still future ready? If you were to give one tip in 30 seconds to a parent, um, what would your key tip be? Hug your child. 
Uh, the, the nature of relationship is even more critical today than it ever has been before. We are endeavoring to achieve a paradox. Um, uh, and the parent is going to have an even more important role as we move forward. Um, uh, give time for your child, give space to your child. When, while you have the opportunity of virtual learning, be inside their classroom. Um, our parents are telling us that they are learning more about their children than they did before. And be open, but most of all, um, collaborate with us as we collaborate with you so that we have our hands around our child, whether it's a virtual or a physical world. I guess the one thing I would want to remind us though, is that we are incredibly privileged. And one of the things that COVID has done has made the gap between those who have and have not um, even greater. So I loved what Shashi was saying um, about our duty, our role to support. But yeah, um, uh, when this finishes, um, uh, go and have a cup of tea and <laughs> give your child a good big hug. Lovely. Thank you so much. So I heard give them space, uh, be open, engage with them, and especially now during online classes and engage and collaborate with the learners to make sure that you achieve that common goal. Thank you so much for that. Uh, Uttaraji, if I could come to you with the same question, please. I completely agree with, with what Spoki has said and Shashi has said, because I think we're all completely on the same page. And if we get together for a cup of tea, it's going to be absolutely phenomenal. <laughs> so uh, moving, moving from that, going to what parents uh, should be looking at. You know, I've always believed that it's very, very important for a parent to uh, give a lot of time to their children and to also inculcate uh, a value-based upbringing. You know, it's living uh, like role models for your children. You can't be expecting your children to be doing those perfect things. You know, I want them to read. I want, you want your child to do everything, but you yourself uh, probably don't. So be more realistic is what I would say. Uh, definitely give children a lot of opportunity because today the world has, you know, zillions of opportunities available at the click of a button also. So try to give the children more opportunity and more exposure to a lot of things. At the same time, you know, we focus a lot on IQ and EQ. These are words which have become very, um, very, you know, common in, in our talks. So definitely IQ and EQ is something that we do work on and we try and, you know, ensure that our children have the right intelligence quotient and the right emotional quotient. But here I would like to add that, you know, we have been looking at two things even before COVID hit. And I feel those two things really stood our children in very good stead in this time. One is social quotient. Because, you know, children have become so um, uh, attached to machines, even before COVID. Now it's a compulsion. But before COVID also, we found a lot of isolation happening, where children were, were you know, getting isolated. We have friends who are our friends from school, friends for life. And we understand the value of having friends like that. And you know, that is what our children need to also understand that we are a social connect, socially connected world and human beings are inherently social beings. So that has to be encouraged. One more thing that I feel we must teach children is how to accept failure. You know, that adversity quotient is what I feel is very, very important. Because if you all the time tell your child, you're so good, you're perfect, you have to do this, you have to do that. And if, a you know, in if for a parent, the child, your child is the best child in the world, which is absolutely perfect. <laughs> but when a child goes into the real world tomorrow, when they go into college, when they go, at work, go to work, you know, there are many times where they may not be the best. So how do they accept it? and move on and try to find that area where they probably could excel. So, you know, adversity quotient, I feel, is something we need to teach our children to understand failure, to accept failure, and to handle failure. And not okay. to go into, you know, uh, negative means to handle it, but to handle it positively and to move on with life. Because you have one life, you have to live it well. And I think that's what we need to teach our children right from a very young age. 
Thank you so much, Uttaraji. I absolutely agree with you. I think time, uh, something that we always struggle to find, but we should be able to consciously find time for our children. Value-based learning, and I know I, I hear uh, you know educators talk about it all the time. Value-based learning is basically giving them an environment which they can mimic and then carry forward. Um, yeah. Social quotient, extremely key in an age where technology plays a very, very vital role. And I think what you've said also about failure is something which I personally feel is very important. One of the key reasons that you see so many suicide cases and depression early age is because people don't know what to do when they get a low score, which honestly is not such a big deal. It's just an exam and it's just a score. Um, so, so what you've said is absolutely valuable. So thank you so much for that input. Shashi ji, if I could come to you with the same question. So just that, you know, live in the moment and let the child live in the moment while uh, education is a journey which is preparing you for all of this, for the joys, the adversity, but to let the child appreciate ordinariness. You know, there's a lot of hype today about being extraordinary. And if the child can just live in the moment and enjoy everyone else's ordinariness as much as your own, spontaneity is something that emerges out of that and there is less boredom i think these are some of the you know maladies that children are struggling with and they keep getting into pathways which lead them har to harm so i would say as uh, spoky said hug them i would say high touch and high impact these are the two very balanced uh, you know uh, means and methods of uh, letting your child be. Uh, high impact would give the relevance, the rigor, the respectful relationship. And high touch is the emotional, social, ethical co content also. And ethics is about not having double standards with the child followers. It's very difficult in today's age of all the fake truth and fake news and post truth and all of that. If the child can question everything uh, safely, you know, and not under, we have a certain value system which, which, which is judgmental. And if we can draw a very subtle parallel between uh, respect and uh, rigor of questioning, I think that will really help. And I think all of us as uh, caretakers need to hand over power. We are not the ones who know everything. If we can let the children teach us, and that's what is happening. There's a beautiful movie, Raising Helen. And I really love that because you, it's children who raise the adult. And somewhere we need to have the humility to understand what the child is saying and yet have a protective shield, you know, that safeguarding around, not let the child fall off the precipice. So I feel it's a, it's a beautiful thing. And if you love doing it, I think children understand love. And that is a very, very uh, sparsely used, you know, emotion. And even if a, there's a pet going, your, your dog will understand if you have this instinct of love and will right. not bark or bark at someone. I think these are things that have to be brought back. Everything is not just a business model. Certainly, the children are not. We have to have that balance. Yes, we have to raise the revenue to see that we look after children well. But is that all? No. And I think we have to be careful, mindful. And that's why mindful. I think Greta Garbo in whatever she was doing, she, Greta Thunberg, sorry, Greta Thunberg, who said that environment crisis and suddenly this happened. So children have a voice. And if you listen to that, all our children are doing things like raising awareness, uh, you know, collecting money, crowdsourcing. I think every school children can see the neighbor, can see the other story. If we can raise sensitive, aesthetically aware human beings, and aesthetics is not just about beauty. It's about so many other things, how you talk, you walk, you reach out. I think the, the world needs that kind of sophistication, which is not money oriented, which is not nothing. And the divide, like Spoke was talking about, the divide between the haves and the have nots. Yeah, that needs to be very careful. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. 
Um, yeah. Sounds so beautiful when you say it, but uh, thank you so much for summarizing that for us. I, I love the bit that you said about living in the moment, enjoy being ordinary. And I think that is something we, we're all in that race of beating the, the next person and being extraordinary. So just enjoy being ordinary, enjoy your life and count your blessings. So thank you so much for that. Um, we're actually today in a world where uh, handwriting has become increasingly obsolete. Uh, complex arithmetic problems is no longer written by hand and internet has replaced the need to memorize facts because everything is available at the click of a button. In a world like that, um, I think what you all said is very true. What a child really needs to learn is not to have the answers, but to be able to find the answers in the pool of information that has been given to them. What a child needs is not to really have the knowledge to understand and code complex systems, but to have the vision to say that if this was a code, code you know, a complex coded system, how would that make human life simpler? What every child uh, possibly needs is not really to be able to solve every problem that life throws at them, but to have the understanding to state that problem to the T and then have the grit, the patience and the innovation to try a zillion solutions. And I think that is what our educators are gunning towards. So thank you so much. Today's discussion has been extremely stimulating for me. And I really think I'll be able to sleep better tonight, knowing that we have educators like the three of you who are taking care of our children. Thank you so much, the three of you, once again. Thank you, uh, Mrs. Shashi. Thank you, Mrs. Banerjee. Uh, thank you, Mrs. Singh. And thank you, Mr. Vila. Farewell until we meet again. Please be safe, be informed, and always be school advisor. Ciao. Thank you. Bye.